In this video, I want to cover some of the factors that come into play when it comes to designing a small mushroom farm. Hey, and welcome to this video. Um, I want to talk you through a lot of the factors that are involved when it comes to designing a mushroom farm. You might have seen in a separate video that as part of our response to the current unusual circumstances, we've decided to up mushroom production at our farm. And that means that we need to make a lot of decisions that we once made. Uh, we've made these decisions a number of times. We've designed an urban mushroom farm. We've designed a farm inside a museum, inside a prison. And we thought it'd be a good opportunity to take you on this sort of journey to give you a good idea of what factors come into play. So we're going to change a lot of things. The current fruiting room is inside the unit over there. We're going to make it the shipping containers behind me into the new fruiting room. And there's a bunch of things that we need to consider. So we want to explain to you why we make certain decisions and why we choose certain solutions. So I'm going to cover that in a minute when I'm back at my computer. We're also going to change the substrate preparation area here behind me um, and all for good reasons that I'm going to cover with you in this video. Right so I'm back at my desk and I've got a whole bunch of stuff I want to cover with you today so let's get stuck in straight away. Mushroom farm design then. There's a whole host of questions that can immediately pop up such as what's the space available? What's the budget available? What are the available materials that you already have and you want to reuse? And last but not least at all is the desired output. What kind of scale should you be aiming for? So I'll cover all of that and a lot more in this video. So for space it's important to ask yourself have you got a space already that you can use like a garage or a barn or a basement or do you need to look around and find a space that's suitable for mushroom growing and in both these cases you need to understand what kind of spaces you need and what you need to fit these spaces out with and this video will help you do that so to start off with a good rule of thumb to use is that a fruiting space typically requires double the amount of size that the incubation room will need um, the key message I want to give you with regards to space is that most spaces within reason can be retrofitted to grow mushrooms. But if you have existing space in mind, it will heavily influence your farm design. So for example here, that picture you can see here on your screen, that's an office floor, a disused office floor in the middle of a city called Exeter in the southwest of England. And it was an unused space and we were there to convert it into a mushroom farm. And you can see the shape and the size and the location, all of that heavily influences the farm design. You'll see more on this farm later on in the video. Um, we had to design the layout for this space to fit the width and the length of the room as well as take into account the access points for electric and water as well as the windows of course to duct in the fresh air and out the uh, spore laden air. Next up I just wanted to comment on the budget that you have available so it's really easy to add on any costs of course and choose the best option every time um, but you want to also build something that's fit for purpose and that you can justify spending money on. So that picture you can see on your screen there that was taken when we were experimenting with growing mushrooms on coffee many, many years ago. And we simply set out an area outside with some shade netting that you can see and some irrigation pipes that, sh that were the hoops basically for the shade netting to uh, hang off, off of. And it worked really well. It was fit for purpose. It didn't cost much at all. You could reliably um, crop mushrooms in there and also sell it. But the problem here was that we didn't have so much control. So after running an outdoor fruiting room like this, uh, for a couple of months we had problems with flies um, and we just had no way of keeping them out of this area. So you can do it on a budget like this, but obviously if you want to do it properly, you'll need to look for other solutions as well. So what this proves is you can set something up for a couple of hundreds for the most basic small home scale setup, but you can also spend thousands and even hundreds of thousands on a mushroom farm if you want to build a full scale commercial mushroom farm producing thousands of kilograms a month. That's not the kind of thing um, we ever got into really. Um, we are looking at clever ways, low tech ways of growing mushrooms and that all fits within a certain budget. So with a lower budget you likely need to do it on a smaller scale, use cheaper materials and do more of the setup yourself. You probably build something that may need upgrading after a year or two, but that's fine. Then you've found your feet, you've got confidence, and then you can look at a bigger budget. You can then build a bigger farm, hire people to help you design and build it, create a farm that will last you for the years ahead. So the point here is that your budget will massively influence the design processes 
as it will dictate the scale, choice of equipment, grow room design and who you'll be doing the work with. We'll make a separate video on how much a mushroom farm costs in the near future. So next up then is desired output. Desired output is one to approach with huge caution because it, it's easy to put numbers into Excel and even easier, easier if you use the back of an envelope of course, but the danger is to underestimate the work involved. And that's exactly what we did a few years back. So the picture there is part of the first urban mushroom farm we ever built. And um, this was one room. There were two similar sized rooms. And in fact, this room itself is quite a big space. First thing we did was knock down the wall in the middle so we had an even bigger space. Then we just sat down and we thought, right, this is what we can fit in. And we were looking at outputs of about 200 to 250 kilograms of mushrooms each week. But we hadn't really taken into account what that means from a staffing perspective. So we hadn't really realized that can easily tip you into the I need more staff and more output and that circle is, can be quite vicious and you might not fully understand all the uncertainties and the pressure that comes with it. So that picture there, those are mushroom columns in the fruiting room that we um, eventually built in that space. And like I said, it was huge. It was way too big for the um, output. We should have considered it more carefully. And it's linked to budget in many ways, as well as what your overall aim is. So do you want to just grow for a few families and friends or do you want to build a larger commercial farm growing thousands of kilograms a month? Do you want to go somewhere in the middle and run a part-time mushroom farm as many people in our low-tech mushroom farming course do? Then that all has different consequences and a whole range of different decisions you make. So the desired output is really a fundamental starting point from which to design your farm as everything else is related in terms of the size of the grow rooms and also the equipment needed for them. This is one of the reasons we like shipping containers because they are very modular. So you can start a bit smaller and just add additional containers over time if you wish to expand. So on to materials available and this is linked to both budget and the existing space that you've got. Often you'll be working with existing space, water, electric access, all that sort of stuff needs to be taken into account to make sure you make the most out of what you've got. If you have budget, then containers or cold store fridge panels are really, really good choices to make. If you're on a tight budget, you might consider a hydroponics tent, for instance, and I'll get back to that later on in the video. Also, you need to consider what is available in your country. It can differ a lot. Trying to source a humidifier unit can be more difficult in some countries, for example, but you can build your own with relatively little equipment. So all of this then leads to the question, where to start? Well, consider scale and budget first as they drive most of the other decisions you'll need to make. And then consider any existing space you may be working with and I already mentioned any available materials as well. It would be such a shame to order a lorry body, for instance, that you're going to convert if you already have a shipping container that you could use. And next up, an important question to ask is, well, which kind of grower are you? So on the left there, there's somebody who's just had their first homegrown harvest. And there's, you know, that's po perfectly possible outside, like I mentioned earlier. Then there's somebody who grew those mushrooms in what he called his rave cave in the office. So he would just go to his work, had a small hydroponic tent set up next to his desk and just tended his crop that way. That's more for family and friends, of course. But you could also, if you have a big office, then you could make it a larger setup as well. And then finally, there are people who do it as a professional setup. So... The image there on the right, that's phenomenal fungi who are heavily into medicinal mushrooms and also fresh mushrooms for sale. So this can work for a lot of different people, from home grower, off-gridders, homesteaders to urban farmers and people who want to run a professional farm as well. And of course the planning and design would be different for each, but let's look at what mushrooms need to grow first so you've got a better understanding of why you need the different rooms that you do need. So you can see the mushrooms growing there in the time-lapse footage that I've popped in here. Um, so what do they need? Well, they need substrate, which is what you can see in this, in this footage here. They need substrate so they can grow across it. Then they need some incubation time to grow, which is what you just saw. And then finally, they need a fruiting environment to fruit in, which is what you can see here. So those three key stages, mixing and inoculating, incubating and fruiting, they take place in three key spaces. Let's have a look at those now. So the first space you need is for substrate preparation, mixing and inoculating. It can be a sheltered area like you can see in the image there. You'll need a workbench and you need a pasteurization and mixing vessel. But that brings us to an important point. All of this depends on how you'll be growing your mushrooms, whether you want to sterilize your substrate 
or use clever materials like pellets, coffee, coffee grounds, and reduce the need to sterilize. Because sterilization comes with a whole range of different techniques, but also a range of investments that you need to make. For instance, in an autoclave, or if you want to use pressure cookers, you can, but that all depends on your choice of substrate and your growing methods. We love growing the low-tech way because it reduces the need for a lot of complexity. So the key point here is that there's a big decision to be made in terms of what substrate you'll use as well as what growing techniques because they will influence not just the size but also the way you need to kit out this space. You can see ours is just really simple and that's the way we like to grow. So then the next room you need an incubation space. The incubation space is where you give the mushrooms time, the mycelium time to run through its substrate, so essentially the food you've decided to give it. So for us a typical spawn run for oyster mushrooms is two to three weeks, for shiitake that would be a lot longer, six to twelve weeks. And I'm mentioning that because all of that has got an impact on the footprint of the room, the size you might need, and that's linked of course to the output. But it's important to bear in mind that if you need to grow shiitake, six to twelve weeks is fundamentally different than growing, growing oysters, so you would produce way more oysters on a small footprint than you can shiitake. In this stage, High CO2 levels are ideal. You don't need to have that, but they are ideal because they'll stop the mushrooms from pinning, which is from growing in the environment where they're not supposed to grow, because they're supposed to be fruited in the fruiting room, of course. Now, these two rooms that I've just covered, or these two spaces rather, so the mixing and inoculation space, as well as the incubation room, are relatively simple to set up. It's the fruiting room that you need to design with more care. Let's have a look. So here you can see a fruiting room that we designed for one of our customers, a chain of hotels in the southwest of England. Um, this fruiting room is aimed to change the conditions, to create the perfect environment for the mushrooms to fruit in. So we want to expose them to fresh oxygen, high humidity and some light. Then mushrooms will form over time and you can fruit the bags two, or two to four times in this same space if you wanted to. When it comes to this room, think of it as autumn, autumn-like conditions, because that's what the mushrooms really, really love. When it comes to fruiting room, you've got many options. So you can keep it really simple. There's a tote there, for instance, for the home grower, top left. You can go for a hydroponics tent, which is really easy to convert into a fruiting room. And then you can also choose more permanent structures. For instance, there, the top right, we've got a room that we designed for the v a Museum in London. And that was... Um, well, permanent for six months, and it was beautifully done with a perspex wall so you can keep a keen eye on the mushrooms fruiting there. There's a separate video on that project. Um, when we did a mushroom farm, we set up a mushroom farm in a prison once as well, and then we had access to a lot of timber, a lot of craftsmen who could help us build a fruiting room, and we chose to go for a um, stud wall, which you can see that's not the farm we built, but that's a similar example. A stud wall with plastic sheeting, and that's a really cost-effective way of building a fruiting room when you're on a tight budget. It can work really well. Of course, the, it could come at a price in the sense that you've got less control, but it's still a good option to use. When I say less control, you just don't have an insulated environment. So, for instance, with the shipping container, which is on the bottom right, or with insulated fridge panels, which is the bottom left, it's better it's easier to control the environment and keep it shut, sealed and um, really well maintained. A final point I wanted to touch on is the flow of a farm and what I mean with that is kind of the workflow. So how these three key stages interact and how the physical spaces are set up can make a huge difference to um, the way your farm operates and also the way you need to work and your time commitment. So it's something to bear thought to, so give some thought to the layout of your farm and how your spaces connect. So at the urban farm we built this work really well. We had a door from the corridor going into the incubation room, then we had a separate door from that incubation room into the fruiting room, and then yet another door that came out of the fruiting room into an antechamber bringing you back to the corridor. And that is a really nice workflow because we could go from the preparing and mixing stage straight into the incubation. Once the bags are fully incubated you can go straight into fruiting, and once you've decided to take a bag out of the fruiting room, you could go straight back into the corridor. You didn't need to go through the incubation room, which is important in case you face any mould um, contamination, for instance, because you wouldn't spread it. You can just go out through 
into the corridor and get rid of your spent substrate. Another point to make in that kind of setup is if you do it in the reverse order, if you just wanted to go into the fruiting room for harvesting, you can just go into the antechamber, change your footwear, put your mask on and go into the fruiting room to do your job and come out the other way. Which means you didn't need to open the door into the incubation room, which means you can keep high CO2 in there. So all of these things bear thinking through. This was a pretty ideal setup for, all, for us. However, it's not often possible if you're working with an existing space. It's also not critical, but I do want to impose this on you that it is worth thinking through, at least when you are in the designing stage of your farm. Right, I hope this video gave you plenty of food for thought, some useful tips. Thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and take care.